What's up, Wisecrack? Michael here. Resistance is futile. The holiday season is officially here. So grab a candy cane and get ready to prostrate yourself at the altar of consumption. Lest your Aunt Mary accuses you of, quote, ruining everything and, quote, being a man-child. To help you celebrate the coming of Yuletide Bliss, we've got the greatest gift of all. Three of the Not The Bees guys' most profound performance choices. <laughs> Seriously, we've been really obsessed with the idea of small choices that can really make or break an actor's performance, or a director's scene, or a video game developer's reputation. So we thought we'd get into it this way. Welcome to this Wisecrack vlog on the many choices of Nicolas Cage. Oh, and also, spoilers ahead for three Nick Cage masterpieces, Moonstruck, Vampire's Kiss, and Mandy. To say Nick Cage is known for making bold choices is kind of like saying the Hulk is known for having a slightly green complexion. It's a gross, flagrant, inexcusable understatement. Whether the dude is hiding behind a door, inexplicably shaving, or inexplicably wearing a prosthetic nose, is anybody hurt? Chances are he's really, really going for it. Now, we've explored the ins and outs of Cageology in our Deeper Dumb Nick Cage video from this past January when, you may recall, we dedicated an entire month to his caginess. During this period, our interest in Cage went from a humorous curiosity to a full-blown obsession. We saw that there's more to him than just crazy accents. I said, put the bunny back in the box. Crazy faces. Or I'll fire you, do you understand? And crazy screaming. Have you ever been dragged to the sidewalk and be until you pissed blood? So let's dive in. We're gonna have a three-way with a declaration of independence. <laughs> Moonstruck. No tour to Nick Cage is complete without mentioning the 1987 rom-com Moonstruck. Cage plays Ronnie, the estranged brother of Cher's fiance. When Cher and Ronnie meet, chaotic sexual tension quickly develops and culminates in them destroying a table and also going to the opera, though not on the same night. This is the film that really put Cage on the map and gave him the leading man status he would happily squander on flicks like The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Here though, his performance as a bread-baking, fiance-stealing tragic sibling is completely captivating. Over by the wall, bring me the big knife. No, Ronnie! Bring me the big knife, I'm gonna cut my throat! The moment we're going to focus on is an early one, but it has relevance to the way the entire movie unfolds. Here it is, in all its glory. I don't care! I ain't no freaking monument to justice! I lost my hand! I lost my bride! Johnny has his hand! Johnny has his bride! You want me to take my heartbreak, put it away, and forget it? The question that you may have on your mind as you consume this delightful moment in cinematic history is this. Why does Cage avoid eye contact and instead stare into his hand for almost the entire duration of this monologue? The answer is more complicated than you might think, and it has everything to do with opera. Opera, as you may know, can be pretty grandiose, with gut-wrenching arias and high notes that are nearly only audible to dogs. Thus, it's largely about affect. While there are all kinds of operatic acting that manifests differently all over the world, the performances, like the stories themselves, are generally rife with intense drama. All premature deaths, pre-Craigslist misconnections, and premeditated acts of violent sabotage. All of which is to say, it's big, it's over the top, and it's supposed to be that way. The person in the back of the theater needs to be as compelled as that jerk who can afford the front row. Film acting, in contrast, has long peddled largely in the highly believable. The extreme close-ups that constitute so much of modern film are impossible in any other medium, as is the potency of point-of-view shots, which literally force the audience to see the world exactly as the character does. Nick Cage defies the reliance on realism in Moonstruck and in basically every film in his oeuvre. But his extreme over-the-topness never exists without purpose, and Moonstruck is a perfect example. As a film about Italian-Americans, it's preoccupied with the fluid relationship between life and opera, an art form that was born in northern Italy in the early 17th century. Cage's character, with his love of opera, would be incomplete without the literal operatics that define him. The heightened drama, and specifically, the staged wonder that is I lost my hand! I lost my bride! isn't for fun, it's the establishment of a tragic character. Every choice Cage makes here contributes to the operatic effect. Speaking into his hand is a move he may have actually pulled directly from opera, where feuding characters will often deliberately look away from one another to signal their conflict with all the subtlety of an oncoming train. 
What's more, he also practically shouts each word, crescendoing as he all but spits out the phrase, Johnny has his bride. At the end of the speech, he glances around the room as if ensuring he has captured the attention of each person. And the operatics of Ronnie's everyday life extends to every scene, from the vaguely dramatic way he swallows his steak, to the very dramatic way he kisses Cher, to the uber dramatic way he knocks this table over. It's unclear whether this moment was improvised or suggested or accidental, though it notably differs from the script, which has him knock all the dishes over instead. Regardless, his sweeping motion suggests the volatility of opera, and throughout the film, every movement Cage makes and every word he speaks exists in a sort of heightened reality. Now, as we noted in our Deeper Dumb video, this particular moment is, by Cage's own admission, taken directly from a similar gesture that was made in the German Expressionist film, Metropolis. German Expressionism was a film movement that flourished in Germany after the First World War, characterized by disorienting, psychologically subjective cinematography. Importantly, it was a huge influence on Cage as a young person, and it featured performances that were highly theatricized, rife with thoroughly exaggerated gestures, and extremely over-the-top facial expressions. Sound like anybody you know? Where are you taking me? To the bed. Vampire's Kiss. The next Nick Cage performance we're gonna look at is a real favorite here at Wisecrack. Yup, the 1988 film Vampire's Kiss, a cinematic masterpiece in which Nick Cage eats a cockroach, wrestles a bat, and cries like a guilt-ridden baby. <laughs> Play for your extended family this Christmas and thank us later. I'm a vampire! I'm a vampire! I'm a vampire! Here, Nick Cage plays Peter Lowe, a megalomaniacal 80s yuppie who is apparently, maybe, possibly turning into a vampire. Over the course of the film, he abuses and eventually sexually assaults his working class secretary before killing another young woman in patented vampiric form. Cage's performance is undeniable in its lunacy. It's utterly flabbergasting at every turn and the most oddly compelling piece of acting we've ever seen. It's best encapsulated by this scene, during which Peter wanders the streets of Lower Manhattan in full vampire form as the film cuts back and forth between fantasy sequences of his former self. You may be wondering, why is he walking this way? Why is he talking this way? Why is it all so inexplicably weird? To understand, we first need to ask, how do most people portray Western art's most famous toothy monster? There are a variety of ways. After all, the character of Dracula alone has appeared in more than 130 films. But most iterations involve a certain emotional distance you'd expect from the undead. From Edward Cullen to most versions of Count Dracula, there's a certain coldness, like their veins are literally filled with ice. Cage, by contrast, goes way back in time when looking for inspiration for his performance, to one of the first vampire films ever made, the silent German expressionist movie Nosferatu. Max Schreck's performance was all primal evil with bug eyes, hunched shoulders, and gnarled hands. It's a fitting performance for a German expressionist film, which tend to dramatically immerse the viewer in the character's skewed psyche via subjective camera angles or tinted frames. But it comes across as more than a little bonkers in an otherwise naturalistic modern film like Vampire's Kiss. In this epic scene, Cage's character wields a makeshift stake and moans with abandon. his masterfully weird body language becomes increasingly contorted, mimicking Nosferatu, while also reflecting his character's rapid decline from an alleged upstanding member of society. His approach gives the performance an air of artificiality that makes it pretty clear Peter is not undergoing some kind of supernatural transformation. See, Cage doesn't exactly play a man becoming a vampire. He more plays the role of a man who buys fake fangs and who may be pretending to become a vampire. That artificiality adds an unexpected dimension to what could have easily been just another vampire movie. Every choice Cage makes in the film further distances the audience from his character. He convinced the film's director, Robert Bierman, to let him wear sunglasses through much of the film. And those shades functionally alienate us, preventing us from properly relating to him. Or consider the hilarious way he cries after assaulting his secretary. <laughs> While most actors would have read the line boohoo and simply cried, 
Cage makes the bananas choice to literally say the words out loud, as if demonstrating his character's inability to experience emotions in any way other than the performative. Chicago Tribune writer Michael Phillips fittingly described Cage as a performer whose truth lies deep in the artifice of performance, which feels particularly true here. Which brings us to our final choice, Mandy. Mandy is a psychedelic horror revenge film in which Cage plays Red, a heavy metal lumberjack whose wife is brutally murdered in front of him by a crazy cult. He seeks revenge and in the process encounters crazy motorcycle monsters with literal knife boners, lights a cigarette with the flames of his opponent's burning severed head, inhales a lifetime supply of cocaine, and so on. Cage's performance is, as always, incredibly weird, but highly specific in its weirdness. That's nowhere more apparent than during this insane bathroom screaming scene. The brainchild of the film's director, Panos Cosmatos, the scene is Red's rawest expression of grief after watching his wife die. And let's just say, Cage is not subtle. You're probably wondering, why is he yell crying? Let's investigate. A film character devastated by loss and seeking revenge for said loss can take a few different forms. You can go with the sad fury of Keanu and John Wick, or the stoic rage of Russell Crowe and Gladiator. Or you can just go pure metal. Throughout Mandy, Cage, like the filmmaker, aptly channels heavy metal music. Indeed, Cage compared the performance to a Black Sabbath album, telling Newsweek that, it's me drawing from various influences, but I try and process them and abstract and mutate them. Mutate them, he does. His scream here, particularly at the beginning, shows some definite roots in the low-pitched growling we associate with heavy metal. Don't believe us? Have a listen. Cage's performance is smart because not only is he expressing enormous pain, he's doing so in a metal way, which works for both his metalhead character and the metal-happy cinematic techniques being used by Cosmatos. Here his screams are expressing grief in all its gradations, from anger to disbelief to complete despondency. Every movement and intonation here feels deliberate and thoughtful. From the way he lunges for his hidden bottle of liquor, to the way he raises his hand like a bear claw, to the way he clutches his neck as he continues drinking. We're very likely watching a man undergo an alcoholic relapse while in the throes of despair. His performance is the perfect contrast to the visuals around him, from his silly undies to the almost oppressively warm, cute, and cheerful bathroom, which bears reminders of his dead wife that makes this only more heartbreaking. Though this scene has been known to incite laughter in some, we'd even argue that that might be an equal but opposite form of catharsis, a different means of registering the intense grief we're seeing on screen. Once again, Cage here tailors his dialed up antics to fit the exact mood of the film he's in. His operatic performance in Moonstruck wouldn't have made sense in the bloody, trippy world of Mandy any more than his deep voice bellowing in that film would have made sense in Vampire's Kiss. What we see after looking at this small sampling of cagey greatness is that in each role, he adapts his antics not only to suit the character, but also to suit the tone and vision of the film. And he does so with an unflinching commitment few actors would risk. Whether you love Nick Cage, or are objectively and indisputably wrong in your opinion of him, you gotta admit, the dude isn't afraid to make a choice and commit the hell out of it. He's beloved because he can bring the same Cage-patented energy to a slew of radically different roles, and still remain utterly captivating to watch. All hail the great, the only, the cagiest Nick Cage. <laughs> <laughs>